Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. There's a fantastical journey in the new book that just came out, written by Stephen L. Arnold. It's titled Delphi, an Epic Poem. And we're going to talk all about this here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Stephen, is here with me. Stephen, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks so much, Corey, and it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. The pleasure's all mine, Stephen. Can you tell me all about Delphi, an epic poem? What do readers find here? Well, Delphi is about a fairy kingdom in a mythical world, Corey. It's dominated by an evil overlord that I named the Blackguard. And Delphi, which is the last hope of survival for the enslaved human race, is also about hope and love. It's about a troll's hope and love for a fairy princess. And the troll in this story must transcend being an outcast in society to actually becoming the hero of the story when he embarks on a perilous journey that is meant to save the princess and is suddenly thrust into a position where he might just be able to save the world as they know it. So it was a mixture of things for me of some of my greatest loves, the Tolkien books, The Hobbit, the trilogy, as well as epic poems that were created by the likes of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, such as The Song of Hiawatha. And since there are so few epic poems in existence, I really wanted to make this an exciting venture in poetry and have all of the poetry rhyme at the same time. Hmm. Stephen, what kinds of readers do you think would really be into this? All ages, Corey. It has the draw of The Hobbit. It has the draw of the trilogy. I think that all ages, it's certainly suitable for all ages. But I did this also from an artistic standpoint. You know, there's so little now that is invested into the arts mm -hmm. in high schools, even in colleges. And poetry is lagging behind. Poetry is a form of art and it's a form of music. So I'm hoping that even the younger people will be attracted to this story and enjoy the poetry and learn something from it. You got to tell me, Stephen, where did the idea for this come from? Well, I was always a fan of that story, The Song of Hiawatha. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an epic poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And it doesn't rhyme. It's prose. And it's beautiful prose. But it's prose nonetheless. And then you have the children's take on poetry by Dr. Zeus. So my inspiration was to create a work that would tell an entire story from the beginning to the end so that the reader can understand all of the characters, the development of the characters, their tribulations, having to fight and win. And it brings hope to people. So as a physician, I've been a doctor for more than 30 years. Hmm. I wanted to do something that actually touched people, brought out emotions that were positive and hopeful. Stephen, are you new to this or have you written and published before? I have written and published, Corey. I've been doing it ever since they handed me the English award in high school. At one time, I was hoping to be a journalist. Somehow things got mixed up and I became a doctor instead, <laughs> very happily, and I never regretted it, but I always continue to write. I've written screenplays for motion pictures, TV. I've written books on poetry. I've written novels. I've written diet books and healthcare books and sports medicine books, and I just love to write. Stephen, I'd be really surprised if you didn't have something else planned for the future, more writing, more publishing. Am I right? You are correct. I have another book right on the heels of this, another epic poem. And uh, I have a book on my poetry and my art photography. I have two novels. One is completed and uh, hopefully will be going to the publisher soon. Another one I'm almost finished with. And I think it's time for me to resurrect some of my earlier healthcare books and do something with those. So you're right. There are more to come. 
Well, I really think readers are going to love this. Again, the title is Delphi, an Epic Poem. It's written by Stephen L. Arnold, published by Christian Faith Publishing, so you can find it everywhere. Go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, and also down the street at your local bookshop, you'll be able to pick this up. Stephen, really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with me tonight. I had a really good time. Thank you, as did I, Corey, and I hope we get a chance to do it sometime again. Readers will find comfort and understanding during some of their most difficult times. In the new book written by Chuck Wilson, it's titled Merle's Sweatshirt, and we're going to talk all about this book. The author Chuck is here with me now. Chuck, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. I appreciate you being here with me tonight. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's great to be learning all about your new book, Merle's Sweatshirt. Chuck, can you tell me about it? Yes, it looks like a children's book, but it's really written for adults just as much. And it really is to help people work through losing someone, mm. the process of grieving and losing someone and getting through that. That's really the focus of the book for both kids and adults. And what inspired you to write this? Well, believe it or not, I had a dream like 25 years ago and dreamed of this story. Woke up and I was like so touched by it. I got up and wrote it down mm. and went back to sleep. And so I just kind of sat on it all these years. And about 20 years later, I actually lost my oldest son. He uh, died and he and his wife both died. It was drugs involved. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was horrible, horrible. It's been seven years now, but they had a, a little baby which my son really wanted my wife and I to raise. And so we brought her home from the hospital and she's been with us ever since. And she kind of became that one that we held on to, the reminder of our son, the one that lessened so much of the pain to have a, this little girl as a blessing. So recently the kids were talking about writing a book and I said, well, I have a story and I pulled it out and they were like, this is great. Let's do it. Let's do it together. And my one daughter-in-law volunteered to illustrate it. And I wrote the book and it's all connected in the end of the book to my daughter, my granddaughter daughter. But that's kind of was the inspiration. Hmm. And when it comes to publishing, have you done this kind of thing before or are you new to it? No, this is the first time. Oh, congratulations. How long of a process was this for you? Well, I had the story already written, so basically it was finding the right fit for a publisher, and then my daughter-in-law getting that done, That she did the real work, you know, <laughs> illustrating it. So once that was done, and maybe it took a year or two to go through the whole process and wrap it up, probably two years. Hmm. After all that time and hard work, and this being such a personal thing for you, Chuck, what was it like to hold that first copy in your hands? Yeah, it's been great, especially because my real goal is to help people work through their loss mm. and remember their loved ones somehow, whether it's a sweatshirt or someone like my granddaughter, daughter, somebody in our life or something in our life that helps us remember the lost loved one as, as we heal, as our hearts heal. And been able to read through this book with lots of people personally who have lost someone and seen them crying, but helpful tears. Even after 20 years losing someone, they're still crying. And they're like, I can't believe I'm still crying. And I'm like, well, there's always more grief. There's always more tears. And these are good tears. They need to come out. So that's what's been really a blessing is to see people heal even further through this book. When it came to the publishing end of things, Chuck, what did you find the most challenging part of it for you? Just finding the right fit and getting it completed, the right fit. So I picked Christian Faith Publishing, and that was a really good fit for what I was trying to do. What are the chances we might see another book from you in the future? Well, <laughs> it could happen. My little daughter, granddaughter, has got lots of ideas. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> She's always coming up with another idea. So, you know, we always write them down and said, someday maybe we'll do it. So we have lots of fun ideas. I'm sure it was a learning experience going through all this, Chuck. So do you have any advice now that you could offer to authors who are just about to embark on this journey for the first time as well? Well, I guess the main thing, because this book means so much to me, is something that we're passionate about or our hearts are touched by it. And that's the most important thing to write about or turn a book into, I think. Well, what a beautiful book this is. I know a lot of people are going to find comfort in the pages. Again, it's titled Merle's Sweatshirt. It's written by Chuck Wilson, 
published by Christian Faith Publishing. So find it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes and also down the street at your local bookshop. Chuck, thank you again for joining me, telling me all about this. It was really nice talking with you tonight. Thank you. Same here. Uniquely You. It's the new, encouraging book written by Jovoli Clark. And that's what we're going to be talking about right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Jovoli, is with me now. Jovoli, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell me all about Uniquely You and what readers will find here? It's just a book about the challenges of growing up as a little girl and some of the things that you go through, kind of wondering where you fit in. And especially it's pertinent today with all of the cultural things that are out there to kind of rob girls of their unique identity. About what age range of girls were you looking at here? Grade school, about grade school age, probably anywhere between, you know, a first grader would benefit. But I read it to my fifth grade class and they really enjoyed it, too. Hmm. What inspired you to write this, Jovoli? What gave you the idea? Well, I have two daughters, and my oldest daughter was a really good lineman playing football on her peewee football team. Mm. I also always enjoyed sports and athletics, and I remember as a little girl liking the color blue and thinking that pink was terrible, and, and my mom was the same way. Mm. And my mom and I were talking one day about how much more complicated the world seems and confusing, and that it seems like little girls like us would have been really confused growing up now. And so just trying to give a book to guide other little girls like mine into embracing who they are and not feeling like they have to be a different person than God's made them to be. That's a great message. Jovoli, have you ever done anything like this before when it comes to publishing? Nope, this is my first book. Congratulations. How long of a process was this for you, the writing and publishing, everything? It was about a year and a half. Really, once I just sat down and started putting the words on paper, it, it went pretty fast for that part of it. And when it came to that publishing process, there's so much involved there, Joe Volley. What did you find the most challenging part of that? Oh, just taking my time to really pay attention to the details and slow down. You just want to get it published so fast, it's easy to overlook the little details that you need to pay attention to. Something really important in a book like this is the illustrations. So how easy was that to get these illustrations lined up? Well, my daughter, my oldest daughter, is who sat down and drew the character for us and did the front of the cover of the book. Hmm. And then my publishing company helped us with the rest of the illustrations, digitizing the character that she designed. So that was a pretty cool process, and she made it look just like her, so it's neat and really special. Oh, wow. And then when that day finally came and you got your first copy in and you got to hold Uniquely You for the first time, what was that like for you? It's a pretty amazing experience just getting to kind of see that. I actually, my mom had passed away before my book got published. Sorry. So pretty cool getting to have that and just how special it was. And now that you're officially a published author, what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of that for you? I would say the most rewarding aspect is getting to read it and have other girls. Actually, I don't know how many women, adult women, have read my book and gone, oh, my goodness, I see so much of myself in this character. Hmm. And I thought that, too. So lots of other women here are like, they can't help but wonder what it would be like for them growing up now in a culture that is embracing transgender and all these other things that just complicates the world so much than to just be a tomboy, you know, or just a little girl who likes blue or dinosaurs or is non-traditional. Have you thought about maybe doing a follow-up to this or maybe writing some other kind of book in the future? Hey, yep. I have two sons and another daughter. My boys, my first words out of my oldest son's mouth was like, so you're going to write one about me and how I love to cook <laughs> for the boys out there? And I was like, that would be good, but you'll have to illustrate it. He's my, both, both of my oldest are really into art, so he would love that. He liked that idea because he's the opposite. He's not as into sports and all those things. So he thought it'd be great to have a book for boys. And doing this kind of thing for the first time can sure be the learning experience. So, Jovoli, is there anything that you picked up along the way that you could put out there as advice to the aspiring authors who are listening to us? I would just say really researching anyone that you're partnering with and not rushing the process, taking your time. You really want to lay that groundwork and make sure that everybody you're working with are people you're comfortable with, with the same vision and goals for your book that you have. Well, I love the message of this book. Again, it's titled Uniquely You. It's written by Jovoli Clark. 
and published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can find it everywhere like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Joe Voli, thank you so much for talking with me here tonight. I had a really good time. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Author Michael Norton has written an interesting examination of the Bible in his new book, Our Redemption Journey, pictured in the lives of the patriarchs. And the author, Michael, is joining me here at the show, and we're going to talk all about this book. Michael, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. So your new book, Our Redemption Journey, pictured in the lives of the patriarchs. Michael, can you tell me all about it? Yes, it was an exciting discovery that I had had when I was studying sanctification through the book of First Peter. I had happened to have been writing a work on the life of Jacob and saw that the pattern was very similar. And then I began to look at the other patriarchs, and I saw a pattern where the four phases of our redemption was very typologically pictured in the lives of the patriarchs. You know, you you see Abraham the calling or the drawing, and then you see Isaac, you see substitutionary atonement, you see positional sanctification, you might say. And then with Jacob, you see from Bethel to Peniel, you see a growth there where he became from a scoundrel to someone very useful for God. So it's progressive sanctification we see. And then the prospective sanctification, you see the future in our glorification when you see Joseph being taken from the dungeon and reigning with Pharaoh, like we're going to be reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Mm. So. It was very exciting to see that pattern because I can see that this is just not a religious idea that was invented for religion, but this was God's loving hand reaching out with a plan of salvation to save the world. Michael, what sorts of readers were you writing for? Well, I really wanted young believers or relatively new believers to see that their salvation or their redemption was more than fire insurance. It's an adventure. We have a lot to look forward to and and the great hope that God has laid out for us. It's very exciting. When it comes to writing, publishing, everything like that, Michael, are you new to this or have you done it before? Well, I wrote a book about 12 years ago. It's called Unlocking the Secrets of the Feast. And I spent two years interrogating rabbis about the feast, you know, from Passover to the Feast of Tabernacles and found that the spring feasts were all about Christ's first coming and what he was going to do then. And then the fall feasts were all about his second coming. And I was very surprised that Rabbi Daniel Lappin from Seattle called me. He said, I got a hold of some of your work. And he said, you got to get this in a book. You got to get it published. Everyone's got to read it. Mm. Well, well, wait a minute. You understand that this is about Yeshua, Jesus in the feast. And he said, let me repeat myself. Get it published. Everyone's got to read it. Wow. And he's an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. He wasn't even Messianic. So I was very surprised. So I could imagine our redemption journey might have taken you a long time considering all the research and everything that went into it. Am I right? Well, I've been thinking about it for quite a number of years. I've taught the scriptures about 45 years or 50 years, and I had seen these phases. But when I saw it was parallel to the lives of the patriarchs, I saw, hey, this is something that could really help people understand more of the adventure that they're going to be experiencing in their salvation, in their redemption. I was able to write it fairly quickly because I used examples, experiences that I had had. Some were very funny. Some were very harrowing, where it illustrated the different phases of redemption that I could illustrate. Since I wrote it in a narrative form, it was very pleasant, and I was able to put it together you know, a lot quicker than I did the first book. Well, there's an awful lot involved in the publishing end of things once you submit your manuscript. Michael, what did you find the most challenging part about the publishing end? The waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, like you say, it takes a while. There's a lot going into it, and that was quite a challenge. What an interesting book. Again, the title is Our Redemption Journey, pictured in the lives of the patriarchs. 
It's written by Michael Norton, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing, so you can get it anywhere, like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, and also at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Michael, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about this. I had a nice time talking with you tonight. Thank you so much. I enjoyed visiting with you. My prayer is that God will do a mighty work in the hearts of believers when they find out how much God has laid out for us in our redemptive journey. Only perfect in God's eyes. Calling the Unqualified, Reflections of My Life. That's the name of the new book written by William C. Mary, Sr. And it's a testimony of faith. And we're going to talk all about it now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, William, is with me. William, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. Oh, absolutely. William, can you tell me all about Only Perfect in God's Eyes? Yes, sir. It's basically a memoir of my actions from childhood through adulthood. The intent was to show people that you don't have to be perfect to get to know Christ or to walk with Christ. As readers will see in my book, there's a lot of mishaps and stupidly child things that I did when I was a kid, but grew up and uh, learned from them and grew closer to Christ as a result. William, what kinds of readers were you writing for here? Well, it was aimed at anyone who's willing to pick up the book and read it. The intent was to say that, like the title says, nobody's perfect. And anyone can get to know Christ in that venue. What was the inspiration? Where'd you get the idea to sit down and start writing this book, William? Well, the idea came from basically my granddaughter. She always asked me to write down stories so that when they come to visit, they can open up a little box in the living room and read different stories. And as I started writing it, I thought, well, you know, this is turning into a book format. So there I picked up on the idea and kept writing and putting things in line chronologically. And there it came to be as a book. It wasn't anticipated at first. Hmm. Once you did get started on it, how long of a journey was this for you? Clear up through when it was published. Through the time it was published was better part of a year. I started turning in the manuscripts at around six months, and then when we went back and forth with editing process and pictures and such, pictures that have to do with my journey in life were in the book. And so it would probably just past a year by the time the book was actually published. Have you ever done anything like this before, William? Have you ever been published? No, sir. I was a firefighter for the better part of my life, and I worked in the technology field. And this is kind of like a bucket list item I was looking forward to after I retired. Well, it must have been something in that day when your first copy finally came in and you got to hold Only Perfect in God's Eyes in your hands for the first time. What was that like for you, William? Oh, that was one of those big deja vu moments in life, I guess you might say. It was a bucket list item that I finally accomplished and wish I'd done it earlier. It was worth the effort and the journey. There's an awful lot involved in the publishing process once you get started on that. William, what did you find the most challenging part of that end for you? Starting the book was difficult for me. I tried to put it down like introduction stuff, and then I finally just put the introduction on the back burner and started writing the stories and connecting them all together. And uh, as I came along, the introduction pretty much wrote itself out at the end of the book. So I was able to introduce the whole concept, write all the different stories together and tie them together, and then develop a conclusion to find a relationship with Christ. Well, now that you're officially a published author, what's the most rewarding aspect of that for you, William? Well, it's inspired me to keep writing. I love doing this writing. My son gave me a plaque a while back, a quote by Benjamin Franklin, either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. Hmm. And I stuck to that mantra with the intent of continuing to write and address God's Word to as many people as I can get it out to. That was going to be my next question. Can we expect maybe to see more books from you then in the future? Yes, sir. I'm real close to finishing the second one. It's called Sacred Flames, A Firefighter's Journey Through Earthly and Divine Fires. It is still in the writing and editing mode, but it's getting close to completion. And then there are others behind it in just uh, concept design right now. William, is there anything you learned along the way of doing this that maybe you could throw out there as advice for the aspiring authors who are listening? Yeah, just start. A lot of people say that uh, they sit and ponder the idea of what they want to do, but just start writing. And as you write things, write it out in an outline, and you'll start to put A above B and B above A and C before A. And you'll just arrange it until it starts to become a really well-designed manuscript. Those points, the first one you learn a lot, and the second one you just get excited about doing all. 
I think readers are going to find this book quite a blessing. Again, the title is Only Perfect in God's Eyes, Calling the Unqualified, Reflections of My Life. It's written by William C. Mary Sr., published by Christian Faith Publishing, so you can find it at Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, or iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. William, thank you again for coming on this show. I had a really nice time talking with you tonight. All right. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Grandmother's Pearls. It's the new book by B.J. Carlson, and it's a great modern-day parable that will teach godly values to young people. And we're going to talk all about this book. The author, B.J., is here with me now. B.J., welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here with me tonight. Thank you, and thank you for asking me. Absolutely. Can you tell me what readers will find when they open Grandmother's Pearls? Well, I'm hoping that they will find a book where, you know, in this world where instant gratification is rampant, the need for waiting on God for His best for us is so important. And this book is an allegorical tale about waiting on God for His blessings, which are perfect and enduring, instead of, you know, trying to make our own, which aren't lasting, and they ultimately crumble before us. I hope that readers will see a picture of our Heavenly Father and how patient He is with us in making those choices. BJ, what readers were you writing for in Grandmother's Pearls? I think my target readers are probably young people, even adults and families. I think it's a great story that can help everyone be reminded that God made each of us specifically special, and He knows just what we need, as well as perfect timing of the blessings that He has for us if we learn to wait on him. How were you inspired to write this book, BJ? Where'd the idea come from? Well, one day I was reading an article about different types of pearls. And when I began to read about the Hanadama Okoya pearl, my mind was suddenly filled with thoughts of how God's word speaks of us with the similar attributes being intricately knit and woven together in our mother's womb. And from there, a story just began to formulate. I began writing down thoughts, and it was so exciting to see the story begin to take shape. And and it actually changed a little bit from what I began writing to the finished product. But it was a lot of fun just kind of getting an idea, just inspired by reading an article. So have you ever done anything like this before, BJ? Have you ever written a book or been published? Well, throughout the years, When my children were young, I would write stories to inspire them, to give them, I guess, valuable life lessons, little stories to teach them good morals. And a lot of times if I spoke to them, if I told them something, you know, it goes in one ear and out the other. (laughs) But I found if I wrote a story, that seemed to stick with them. And, And it's such a blessing. Sometimes I'll hear, you know, one of my children telling their children the same story. And I think, oh, that's so neat that that (laughs) stuck with them, you know, and that it was so profound to them that they would tell the same story to their children. And so I've written many, many small stories. I've also written plays and Bible studies for churches that we belong to along the way. And usually, you know, my writing comes from a special need for a particular message. And then I'll formulate a story around that message, and that's specifically for the age group that it's intended for. And I've never had anything published except for a poem many, many years ago. I had a friend who, it was kind of a dare, and she was like, well, you know, they're going to choose some of these poems. And I thought, I can just make up something on the spot. I bet it would be chosen to be published, and it was. It was (laughs) kind of a fun thing to do. But other than that, I've never had anything published. And so this was kind of neat to see one of my stories in print. Once you got started on this, was it a long process, clear up until it was published? Well, the actual writing, I sat down that same day I read the article about the Hanadama Koya Pearls. And I would say in within two days, I had most of the story written. And I at that point, I wasn't really thinking about having it published. So it sat for two years and I read it to one of my friends and she was like, you have to get that published. That is just an amazing story. It really spoke to my heart. And I know there are a lot of people who would love to hear it. And so so even though it's a short story, it took over a year to actually get it published. Again, the title of this book is Grandmother's Pearls, 
It's written by B.J. Carlson and published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can find it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, and also down the street at your local bookshop. B.J., thank you so much again for coming on the show and telling me all about this. I had a nice time talking with you tonight. Well, thank you, Corey. I sure appreciate it. Author Dana DeWint has crafted a powerful true story in his new book, Checkmate, the Morgan Stanley Whistleblower. We're going to be talking about this book right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Dana, is here with me. Dana, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Corey. Thanks for asking me. Absolutely. Dana, can you tell me all about Checkmate and what you wrote about here? Well, Checkmate is the story of my finding out that Morgan Stanley violated a number of important securities laws while I was working for them. This all happened back in the early part of this century, and it's been necessary to attempt to go through and find out what the core reasons were for them misleading the financial advisors and causing them to buy a security that went to zero. It takes quite a long time to do this. I'm not a pure regulator myself. I was a branch manager for about eight EF Hutton offices back in the 70s and 80s, so I had quite a bit of compliance training. And there didn't seem to be anybody at Morgan Stanley who was willing to step up and challenge both Morgan Stanley and the regulators. So I've done it. The book is very important. It's a succinct book. It's probably only about 44 pages, but all the readers have to do is read the page 24. And then if they'd like to, they can move over to the collateral internet domain site, which is www.mswhistleblower.com. And I put all the documentation and some various important motivating influences as to why I stuck this out for the last two decades. Hmm. Dana, what kind of readers were you writing to here? Well, primarily, if you take a look at what people say about whistleblowers and so forth, it's been somewhat a dangerous occupation at times. Morgan Stanley's known that I've been after them since when I contacted them back in 2004, along with the SEC and several other regulators. It was important for me to write Checkmate because it really is necessary for this information to be available in case there is anyone on the other side who feels that I shouldn't be moving hard against them. Consequently, that's why I named the Checkmate. I have run them out of moves. They don't have anywhere to go except the admission of what I've found. And this is fairly interesting. There's probably about 35,000 different transactions that Morgan Stanley is obligated by law to have canceled at the time they were done because they violated the state's registration laws, of which on the internet domain site, you can look at the Florida consent order, which is about 17 pages long, and you can read the admissions and you can read that they signed it. The state of Florida picked up $1,291,000 for signing this document, and they did a horrible job at protecting the investors in the state. It's a problem if you are like me and you want to stand up to four or five different Goliaths at the same time, knowing that they have no defense. They only have the ability to thwart you with time, non-performance, and so forth. So I think it's a very fascinating story. I would like to have everybody get back the money that they're owed. In my opinion, it's somewhere north of $750 million because the interest rate and the interest penalty has been continuing to run against Morgan Stanley for non-performance and not paying back people that they fleeced. Dana, once you sat down and got started on Checkmate, was it a long process for you to write and put through the publishing process? No. I spent probably four or five months, and then I found a very talented young technician who could create the website, which supports the book. You know, we took all of the pictures of the documents and put them in PDFs on the site, starting with reasons for my having to do this by being a Morgan Stanley employee. They say that you're not only requested to turn in information which goes to the heart of a fraud or a business ethics violation, but you're required to do it. So what a story this book tells. I think readers are going to be really into it. Again, it's titled Checkmate, The Morgan Stanley Whistleblower. It's written by Dana DeWint, 
and published by Newman Springs Publishing, so you can find it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or iTunes. Well, Dana, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about this story and the book. I had a nice time talking tonight. Well, thank you for giving me the time to elaborate. There's a lot of information, and I needed to get the reader's interest. Joining me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm speaking with author Dennis Barch. Dennis, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Absolutely. I wanted to say congratulations. You have a new book out titled Poems from a Twisted Mind. Uh, Dennis, can you tell me about this? In this depressing time, you can't turn on the TV. All there is is bad news. And I started writing in high school. And I found out that I could make beautiful women laugh. <laughs> and I kept writing. Well, I got so many points that I had to make a book. I was told to do it. You know, you have to have the person with the right sense of humor. <laughs> and some people don't like it. Some people love it. <laughs> it takes a person with a good sense of humor. And actually, most of these are written for women. You can talk to a woman and you can find out if she has the right sense of humor. And if she doesn't laugh, well, <laughs> sorry, girl, I got to go. <laughs> that is what this book contains, all poems. Dennis, have you ever published before this? This is my first time. I was told to do it 20 years ago and I didn't. So what made you decide to do it now? Well, I'm getting older, and seeing as I still write, I have more time on my hands. My kids are grown, and my wife's gone, so I decided now was the time. Hmm. So the publishing process, there's a lot involved in that. Dennis, what did you find the most challenging part of that publishing end of things? <laughs> my challenge with technology, hmm. you know, like, I have no problem writing and but oh, there is so much that these kids know that I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes it gives you a real good headache. What are the chances that you'll write another after this? I'm already halfway through on a second book. Actually, I think I get better as time goes on, and it's easier to write. But I'm hoping by the end of the year, maybe come out with a second book. Wonderful. And now that you are a published author, Dennis, what's the most rewarding aspect of that for you? Is to show people that in these miserable times that you can laugh mm. and have them read the book and see them laugh. And that's what gives me the most joy. And publishing for the first time can be quite the learning experience. So, Dennis, is there anything you picked up along the way that you'd be able to throw out there as advice for aspiring authors? If you feel that you have a talent, it's time to explore it and put it out there for the public. That's good advice. And Dennis, when you're writing this kind of thing, is writer's block ever something that you encounter? It does. Some days I cannot write. And if you force it, you end up with stuff that's not meant to be read. Mm. And yes, I can't write every day. And believe it or not, when I'm around beautiful women is when I can write the best. And when it comes to what the book was actually going to look like, you know, it might not have been something that you thought on early on when you were writing this, but it's got to have a cover. It's got to look good. Was that an easy thing to come up with? No, that kind of... Actually, I'd never thought of that. And I, now that I put out one, I will be thinking about it for the next one. <laughs> now, that was the real challenge. And that was out of my ballpark. It took a lot of help from my friends. Well, I think readers are going to love this. Again, the title is Poems from a Twisted Mind. It's written by Dennis Barch, published by Newman Springs Publishing. So pick it up at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Dennis, thank you again for coming on the show and talking with me here tonight. I had a really nice time. Well, thank you very much.
Author Rachel Tolbert Smith has written a heartwarming new book titled Mommy, Tell Me About Heaven. And we're going to talk all about this book here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Rachel is right here with me. Rachel, welcome. Thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited and looking forward to this podcast. I'm excited to learn all about Mommy, Tell Me About Heaven. Rachel, can you tell me all about it? I'm going to try not to cry <laughs> because it's very personal to me. This book is about my son. I just had a dream about him last night, too, so that's why it's even more emotional. I'm usually not so emotional. It's been a minute. But, yeah, my son passed away. Sorry. When he was 15 years old. But when he was a little boy, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years old, he was always asking me about heaven. And had I known... Uh, he was going to be leaving me at, at 15. I'd have, God only knows, you know, I'd have put him in a closet somewhere, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kept him safer. But he used to ask me all the time, Mama, tell me about heaven. You know, he was always curious because he was always afraid of dying. He was afraid of storms. And we thought he'd outgrow it, you know, because he was, like I said, definitely afraid of storms. If, if a cloud in the sky got dark, he would, you know, want to come in and he was afraid. We talked a lot about heaven as he was growing up, and he would ask me, you know, what's heaven like, Mama? And I would share with him what God shared with me about heaven, how beautiful it is, and it's paradise. It's our home. That's where we're all going to be, and that's where we're all supposed to be one day, you know? So I'd, he'd ask me, you know, what, what if I get hungry in heaven, Mama? And I'd tell him, well, you just take a pinch of the cloud, and, <laughs> and it tastes like anything you want, you know? If you want pizza or popcorn or candy or, you know, it's anything you want. And, you know, he asked me if there was animals in heaven. And, you know, the Bible talks about animals, horses and different animals that God's going to come back on. And, uh, I, you know, I'd share with him, yeah, there's every animal that you'd ever want to see is in heaven, and, and but they can't hurt you, you know, and you can enjoy them. You can ride on their backs and you can, you know, go under the ocean with them and you can swim with them and you never have to worry about holding your breath because you can't hurt yourself in heaven and you can jump from the trees. You can climb the trees as high as you want, and you can jump down and not hurt yourself. And because he loved to climb, he loved to play sports, he loved to do so many different things. So this book is all about my son, Tyler. And what gave you the idea to sit down and write this book and, and publish this story? You know, I wanted to do it for years, and I just couldn't because it's very emotional for me. Mm. So finally, one day, I talked to a friend of mine that also published books. And, you know, and I asked her how she, you know, got started. And she said, I just sat down and I prayed about it and started writing. And she said, that's what you need to do. You need to sit down. And because I had started it for years and I never could finish it. And after she talked to me and really encouraged me to pray about it and let God, let the words come out in writing. And so I did. I got up at like 4 a.m. one morning after our conversation and I just wrote it and I finished it within a couple of hours. And I thought, this is my son's story. This is his story. You know, our story we shared together in Paradise, where he's at today. There's a lot involved when you get to the publishing end of things. Rachel, what did you find the most challenging part of the publishing process? You know, they coached me through the whole process. I really didn't have any challenges as far as struggles of any sort. I really just let the Holy Spirit guide me and the illustration part of it. They were so helpful. And they saw my image and they put it all in a book that I visualized in my mind, you know. Mm. So I really didn't have any struggles. I really didn't have any challenges. So this whole thing, you just visualized it in your mind the whole time. You were looking at it a lot on the computer screen. But then, Rachel, that day finally comes and you get the first physical copy in and you get to hold this for the first time. What was that moment like? You know what? That moment is the most important moment of my life. It brought him back to me and our story. It was his story and the story we shared with each other in my hand. So it was everything I could imagine. Plus more. Rachel, what's your best piece of advice that you could give to the aspiring authors who are listening to us? You know, that's a tough question because when you're motivated or moved or you have something in your heart that you need to put on paper, it's really not hard to do if you just pray about it first. And I really believe the Holy Spirit will guide you to the story that you're trying to propose for other people to share and to receive. I think this book will be a real blessing to so many readers. Again, the title is Mommy, Tell Me About Heaven. It's written by Rachel Tolbert Smith, published by Christian Faith Publishing, so it's available everywhere. Get it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or even traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Rachel, thank you so much again for telling me the story about your son and this book. I had a really nice time talking with you tonight. 
I did too. Thank you for taking the time out to do this with me. Thank you. It's very important. I'm blessed. It's the story of a life-changing camping trip in the new book by Chuck Measle titled The Priesthood of the Purple Buffalo. When I get to find out all about this book, Chuck is with me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Chuck, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Corey. Appreciate you inviting me. Well, I appreciate your time. Chuck, can you tell me all about the priesthood of the Purple Buffalo? What are readers going to find here? In the priesthood of the Purple Buffalo, I tried to weave fiction with Indian wisdoms together to tell a story that I really think that should give a reader pause to think. And I've kind of styled the stories into parables that are taught to the younger Indian braves as they grow up into their teens. So it kind of has almost like a religious flair to it, but it's not overhandedly religiously. It's got a narrative and it's an entertaining story. And like you said, Ramon is a realtor and he's struggling with his career and he may be a little bit lazy, but there were just a lot of things about being in real estate that bothered him, like the three D's of real estate, if you've ever heard of those, death, divorce, disease. The manager was always going, you need to find people that are going through these things, not to help them, but to actually use their situation to your advantage. So he was kind of set up with that and was looking for another path. But he went on a camping trip in the extreme cold of a South Dakota winter and was forced to survive in a different world than the one he was raised in. And his religious beliefs were challenged, his upbringing being completely different from what he experienced in the life with the natives. Chuck, what sorts of readers were you writing for here? I was looking for really any age from about 18 years up. Since this is set kind of like a Western, I know that kind of in some ways appeals to men more. A lot of the women I have read the book have been really, have really enjoyed it. So how did this book come about, Chuck? What sparked you to write it? I felt like I was called. I felt like there was a divine calling placed on me that I had to answer. I felt like I had to move in that direction to doing it. Once you sat down, got started on this, how long of a process was this for you? It took me about 10 years. Now, I had another full-time job. I actually retired from that and was able to finish everything in about six months after I did that. But I'd been working on it. It had been cultivating or germinating in my mind for many years to get to the point that I'm at now. Is this your first time publishing, or have you done this kind of thing before? I have never done anything like this. I've had some poetry and stuff like that that has been published, and I've written songs and stuff like that kind of goes with the poetry, but not really any of the songs have been published. Maybe performed somewhat, but not published. This book is the first story that has been published. There's a lot involved in that publishing process. Chuck, what did you find the most challenging part of that for you? Maybe sending out query letters you know, reaching out to people and wondering if they had ever really read the um, book and whether they were going to read it. So that was maybe the hardest process. And after that process, after all that time that you spent on it, what was it like when you finally got to hold that first physical copy that came in? It was satisfying. It was satisfying. I certainly had a feeling of fulfillment. That's kind of a life goal that I've got now. There's lots of processes I've gotten involved in that maybe I didn't finish, but it felt really good to have the feeling of fulfillment that I'd finished that and very satisfying to actually see the final product. Do you think you have more books in you? Can we expect more from you in the future, do you think? I think so. Uh, I actually have had a couple of people that have said, are you going to do a sequel to this? And I have worked on the sequel. I was working on calling it The Shaman's Apprentice. The Shaman being, of course, what the Indians would consider their medicine man, but also their spiritual leader. So that's what I was going to name the sequel was The Shaman's Apprentice. I think readers are really going to love this. Again, the book is titled The Priesthood of the Purple Buffalo. It's written by Chuck Measle and published by Covenant Books, so you can find it on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble, on iTunes, and also at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Chuck, thank you again for joining me tonight and telling me all about your work. I had a nice time chatting. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate it. Thanks. I enjoy talking to you. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable. 
where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.